Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll look at a new poll that shows Senator John McCain at his lowest job approval rating in 21 years. We'll hear from APS on a recent survey that suggests a disconnect between the utility and its solar energy supporting consumers. And we'll meet internationally known ceramic artist Wayne Higby. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simon. Senator John McCain's job approval ratings are at their lowest in 21 years. That's according to a poll released earlier this week by the Phoenix-based Behavior Research Center. And joining us now is Jim Haynes, president and CEO of Behavior Research Center. It's good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure. Uh, lowest approval rating in uh, 21 years. Let's start with when this poll was taken. Uh, before, after immigration, before, after background check and guns. Before both. Before both. Right. So what do we take from that? Uh, what, the main thing I take from it is that, uh, is that people are uh, down generally, uh, with regard to uh, incumbent politicians, we, we we see that with with relatively no, low numbers for the governor. With uh, we see it all over the country with incumbent senators, governors. People just aren't happy. It it goes with it goes with their whole attitude about the economy. They're not they're not pleased with where things are. As far as McCain is concerned, is it uh, is it job performance? Is it personality? Could it be fatigue? It could be any of the three of those. Yes, um, it, 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 the senator has has always been a, a maverick. Uh, he doesn't follow uh, party lines. It's been one of the appealing things about him throughout his career. Um, but every time you kind of stray from the from from the farm, you you pick up uh, some animosity from. So I don't know what it is. It sounds like it, from what you were you were your survey shows. Um, for some Republicans, he's not enough of a conservative. For some Democrats, he's not enough of a maverick. He seems like he's not enough of some things to people. That's that's correct. Another way of saying it is, some Republican to some Republicans, he's not enough of a Republican, and to some Democrats, he's still a Republican. There you and, go. And and um, that's that's kind of the price a maverick is going to pay. And I think Senator McCain realizes that. He's always realized it. He's he's his own man. But it, but at the end of the day, it's still not an indicator of whether or not he can or will be reelected. The uh, as far as McCain's numbers historically, uh, again, twenty-one year low here. But has it does it does it ebb and flow with him, or is it? It it it, it ebbs and flows actually from about two thousand five, two thousand six. It's it's been on on kind of a a, a downhill slide. That's also not. Um, uh, unusual for a long-term incumbent. I mean, you may recall Senator Goldwater in his last run for office almost got beat. Mm -hmm. At the end of the night on election night, most of us thought Bill Schultz was the governor. I mean, the, the yes. senator. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it just gets hard. We mentioned pre or post uh, the immigration uh, reform bill. Um, you'd have another survey now regarding immigration. Tell us about that and how that may factor into the next uh, poll taken regarding Senator McCain. I, I, I think I think it, it's surprising, uh, going to be surprising to a lot of people. Two, uh, three quarters of Arizonans support a path to uh, citizenship for uh, illegal immigrants that are in the country now. Uh, based on four criteria: they that they have no criminal record, that they um, pay taxes, that they uh, um, register their 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 presence here, and that they learn to speak English. Same. Uh, w what we did was take all the normal objections of of the kind of anti-immigrant group, uh, and say, okay, let's take them off the table. Now, now, what do you think? And the public said, no problem. They feel the same way with respect to a path to to work permits for those that aren't interested in membership in in citizenship that just want to come here and work. Um, I think the senator's uh, uh, leadership in the in on 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 those issues is going to bode very well for him. I, I think he's on 
Arizona's side on, on those issues. As far as the immigration poll is concerned, uh, specifically that those numbers, uh, changes different than what you've seen in the past, or is that just a, simply a different question? That was asked? We haven't asked the same question in the past. We asked this particular question and the way we did it because uh, we were kind of interested in one that the field organization did in California a, few, a couple of months ago, and we asked it the same way. Results came out very similar. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting that it's, it's a, it's a, it paints a different picture of the average Arizonan than most of the rest of the country has, has been getting in the last few years. Last question. Numbers for McCain, lowest in 21 years. However, that does not mean that he's in necessarily political trouble when it comes to re-election, correct? That, that's exactly right. That's what I meant when I said it's not an indicator. It, 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 at the end of the day, at the next election, there's going to be somebody else running against him. And it's going to be yes. Senator John McCain or Candidate A. So this poll in itself doesn't, doesn't address that at all. So you may not be too excited with McCain, but if Candidate A doesn't do it either, uh, McCain could very well get your vote. Most Pauls most probably would get your vote because he's a known quantity. There you go. Uh, Jim, good to have you here. Thanks for joining Always us. We appreciate pleasure. it. Okay. Inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. A recent poll shows widespread support for solar power and opposition to programs that limit choice for solar supporting energy consumers. Now, last week we discussed the poll and heard criticism of APS regarding the future of solar energy. Tonight we hear from Arizona Public Service. Joining me are Mark Schiavone, Executive Vice President of Operations for APS, and Jeff Goldner, APS Senior Vice President for Customers and Regulation. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining. Good to be here. Jeff, we'll start with you regarding this widespread support for solar choice and widespread opposition to some programs that APS seems to support. What do you see here? Well, Ted, we know that our customers like and support solar energy, and we like and support solar energy as well. APS has been doing solar for 60 years. Uh, by the end of this year, we'll have about 700 megawatts of solar that's split between rooftop solar systems that our customers install as well as large-scale solar plants like the Solana plant being built near Gila Bend and uh, smaller uh, solar plants that APS uh, uh, owns. The issue we're really talking about is how to ensure that solar energy in Arizona is sustainable. And part of that discussion involves a policy called net metering. It's one of the ways to subsidize rooftop solar systems so that rooftop solar can be part of the energy mix in Arizona. And that's really one of our strengths, is we've got a diversified portfolio of nuclear and coal and natural gas, as well as rooftop and larger scale solar plants. Net metering, and let's define net metering here. That's basically where the rooftop customer uh, basically sells power back to APS, correct? That is correct. And it, what, what's, so what would be the problem here? Well, the problem, in the, it really is a cost issue. So you have a rooftop solar uh, on your home, and you have a certain amount of load that your home consumes. If your system during that time frame generates more than what your, power, your home consumes, it goes back to the grid. When it goes back to the grid, then you're being paid for that power going back to the grid. And this is where the problem lies. You're not being paid for any of the wires, the transformers, the poles, the infrastructure 
for transferring that power back to the grid. You're not paying for us to be on standby while you're self-supplying. We're needed so that if something happened, a cloud passed over, you still need our power to flow from you. So you're not totally disconnected from the grid. And what's happening is that cost, those fixed costs for the wires, the poles, the transformers, are being paid for the consumer, the customer, that doesn't have rooftop solar. And that's the cost shifting that's taking place, which is a subsidy. So, so how do, the, the cost shifting that is taking place, how do you balance that out when we have folks, like we did last week, basically saying that what you're trying to do there by undercutting, and they see undercutting net metering, what you're doing there is you're killing rooftop solar in Arizona. You're not killing rooftop solar. What, we haven't proposed anything in terms of resolving this. What we've got right now is a situation where uh, the customers who are putting the rooftop solar on can avoid all of the cost of that infrastructure. And as Mark said, the rooftop panels don't work without all of that infrastructure being there, from the transmission system back to the power plant. And so if they're not paying for it, then other customers are paying for it. So it really becomes an issue of balance. Uh, I think it would be tragic in Arizona with our solar resources uh, for us to have the equivalent of a housing bubble burst because we didn't understand the cost implications of a policy like net metering. So we just want to understand that, talk to the stakeholders about it, see what a potential solution would be going forward that could help make that sustainable. What would a potential solution be? If the solutions come to the table. Well, let's, let's, not, let's stop the bickering and throwing of stones against, this, uh, against the issue. Let's sit down and have a dialogue. The real problem in our, in our, from our perspective is you have to understand what the cost of all those services are. And I think once all the customers understand the cost of supplying electricity, they'll understand that there's a way to solve this problem. It may be how you look at transmission. It may be some of the distribution costs. There's some place where you can find and fix net metering. So we're not against that metering. We believe in paying for the service that that customer is providing to another customer or to the grid. How do you balance out, though, these added costs and the cost shifting now with future avoided costs provided more people go solar, uh, less demand for power plants and such down the road? It seems like a lot of folks are going solar. And again, the argument is that the more that goes solar, the less they need of APS. APS business model takes a hit. That's what you guys are worried. That's what we're hearing. Well, and that's, that's really the question, because right now you're not removing any of the infrastructure once you put the solar panels on. You may avoid some future infrastructure, and should we value that now? Should the policymakers give a value to avoiding that future cost? We don't do that when we construct a resource today. But what we know is the cost for the existing system is all here, and it's not going away. And so it's really then about fairly allocating that cost between customers who put rooftop panels on, may benefit us in the future, and then customers that don't. It's a generation resource, and you need to treat it as a generation resource, just like the, we have generation, whether it's Palo Verde nuclear plant, whether it's Ocotillo power plant sitting in Tempe, Arizona, one of our uh, utility scale solars, it's a source of generation. And you have to treat it as a source of generation and pay for that generation as that source. We agree there may be some other costs in the future that you can look at, but we don't know what it looks like because we don't know where solar is going to be in the future, how many homes, what areas, and so on. So it's hard to understand infrastructure. On the distribution network, we don't believe there's going to be much savings in that respect. The savings we think, if there is going to be savings, will be in the transmission system. So it, it, it's the dialogue that has to take place, though, to come to closure on where do you think those savings may occur, uh, occur in the future. And to get that dialogue started, we talked, of course, to the folks that took the poll last week, and they were representing Tusk. I want you to get a real quick soundbite here from what we heard last week, the idea that uh, APS is a monopoly and it wants to end consumer choice on how folks get uh, electricity. Here's what they had to say. They figured out that every time a, a consumer in Arizona puts solar panels on their roof, APS sells a little bit less electricity. And that just doesn't work for the monopoly that never had to deal with that before. Uh, and so that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to take away that choice and that option. Respond, please. The word option I find interesting, uh, choice of words, because customers have always had an option. People have been putting solar on a roof long before net metering or any of this dialogue took place. It was their choice to do that. They absorbed the cost for that. Today we're asking their neighbors to absorb the cost for what they're doing. So it's a little bit different today than what you may have done 20 years ago and putting rooftop on. So I don't agree that they're losing choice. I think the customers still have choice. This is really a cost issue, and it's who's going to subsidize the cost for that power that's returned to the grid.
That's the simple part of this uh, equation. And I, and I hear subsidy also coming from the other side, basically saying that uh, the more, again, the more they go solar, the more someone goes solar, uh, the less profit comes into APS or the less revenue that comes into APS. And then they're winding up thinking they are subsidizing APS when the whole world is going solar. How do you respond to that? It's it's not as the revenues are reduced from people going into solar what happens is that the infrastructure doesn't change so if you still have that infrastructure and that's the critical thing to understand with rooftop solar systems and with net metering the infrastructure has to be there for it to work so you get back into just the fundamental fairness question that says someone has to pay for that infrastructure if you're a regulated utility you're cost based and so the infrastructure is paid for by the customers that don't have solar on their system you can solve that by valuing the solar in a certain way and make it a sustainable policy. That's really the discussion that we're having. And, and I believe there was a California study looking at uh, the, the future of, of distributed energy and the fa they factored in future benefits. They factored in, factored in, I think, infrastructure as well. They saw that there were benefits for all ratepayers, not just, you know, that we hear a lot that the rich are benefiting from this and the poor will get hurt. They're saying, again, because of these avoided future costs, that things do tend to even out. Are, are you buying that? <laughs> There's many studies out there today, including the one you're talking about, there are benefits. I mean, there's no question solar provides a benefit, whether it's on a roof or whether it's one of sitting out in Gila Bend. So we wouldn't, wouldn't argue about the benefits. There's some environmental benefit. How do you, how do you put a cost to that? There's a uh, benefit as far as when you may need new generation. It may push it back some, sometime, but you don't know that until you get to that point. And that's part of the challenge you have. So I would disagree in concept with the outcome of that study because I think it's, it's, use as a predictor, and we don't know yet what those costs will look like in the future. And, and Ted, I mean, one of the things they're talking about in that study is simply the excess energy that's generated. Mm -hmm. So they're not looking at the cost shift that occurs when customers that use the system aren't paying for the cost of that system. And so the, in, in the California example, the utilities are talking about a $1.2 billion per year shift in costs that's not being discussed in that particular study. And real quickly, when you have that kind of added load to those who don't have solar, doesn't it become a perpetual machine? If I don't have solar and I'm paying more because my neighbor does, I'm going to want more solar, and thus, again, less comes in. I mean, does APS have to look uh, in the future? Is this, is this a business model that can sustain itself? We don't think it's a model that can sustain itself for any of the customers because your, your rates will continue to increase for those that don't have solar. And eventually, as Jeff mentioned earlier, the housing bubble is the great example. Everything collapses around it. So now's the time to fix it. The, you know, there's 16,000, roughly 16,000 customers that have it today. We've got to get ahead of it because, to your point, as people see this, they're going to say, I want it, and someone's got to pay for it. Last point. We have about 30 seconds left. What, what do we take for what, what? If I'm thinking of putting rooftop solar on, if I've got rooftop solar on, are, are, are you an antagonist? Are you my friend? What, who are you? If you're, if you're a supporter of long-term solar energy in Arizona, you've got to find a sustainable solution, and that's what we're working to do. And so you should follow the debate. You should watch what's happening. Uh, participate in the debate if you want. It's ultimately going to go from us to the Corporation Commission for a discussion of the policy, but we're looking for a solution to something so that this can be uh, sustained in the long term. And if I could, solar is an important part of our future. It's in everything we provide to the Arizona Corporation Commission as far as our resource planning. We want solar to be sustained. We just have to find the right way to do this. Gentlemen, it's good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. We Thank appreciate you. It.
Tonight's edition of Arizona Art Beat looks at the work of internationally known ceramic artist Wayne Higby, who uses ceramic vessels for evocative landscape imagery. We welcome Wayne Higby to Arizona Horizon. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ted. It's, now, I was reading up on you, and I heard this quote, meditation on the relationship between mind and matter. Is that what you do? <laughs> I think that's probably what we all do. But I focus on that to some extent in my ideas behind the work. And so talk, to explain exactly what you do, when, when, uh, what you're trying to accomplish. What do we take when we look at one of your pieces of art? Well, my work has been a kind of um, relationship to American landscape. And it kind of draws some resources from the history of American, American landscape art. But I think more than that, for me, it's been um, the physicality of materials and processes. And I work with my hands. I make these things. But the imagination is certainly a part of that process. So the imagination is mind free. And so the matter and the physical thing connected to your imagination is this meditation on material process and mind. Interesting. Uh, why landscapes? What got you started in landscapes? I was born in the West. I was born in Colorado Springs. And uh, I grew up there. was an only child. Had a horse. Um, I guess that pretty much explains that part. Well, yeah, I, well, that's interesting. How does an only child with a horse wind up getting into... Was there a time when you... Did you do, like the rest of us as kids, did you do little glazed things and pot? How do you get into... Uh, yes, I think so. You know, I think in particular, perhaps, as an uh, as, uh, only child, you know, I just didn't have that many people to talk to. I didn't have brothers or sisters. But I worked with sticks and paper and glue, and they spoke to me. I think clay, of course, you know, I remember perhaps picking up that first lump of wet clay and pressing my thumb into it and having it say, hello, <laughs> you must be Wayne. <laughs> and so from that point, we have a conversation. So materials and processes have always been that conversational other, that sense of how I communicate with myself and now, of course, how I communicate with other people. And some of your, your I think we have a chance to take a look at some of your artwork here. Um, what do we look for when we look at a... Obviously, there's landscape elements here, but what do we look for when we look at ceramics, when we look at pottery, when we look at this form of art? You know, I always say I, you know, I'm a, an art professor as well, so I have a lot of students, and I, I encourage them not to look for anything. I encourage them just to be vulnerable to looking. Yes. Come and have an experience. Don't project. Try to just enjoy what you're seeing. And I think if that can happen, you will be able to receive whatever the work is saying. And is it the same thing when you work like you do architectural installations as well? Is that the same idea? Don't think too much. Just sit there and let it wash over you? Let it, let it come in. You know, be vulnerable to it. You, know, you don't have to immediately decide what it is. But enjoy it. And, and certainly pay attention. You know, uh, as a craftsman, I always say, well, craft is the art of paying attention. And paying attention to where you are, what you're involved in, what you see, is a way of being vulnerable to the world, having it come in. Well, with that in mind, do you wait for the muse, or do you go <laughs> sit down every day and find the muse? <laughs> well, I certainly don't wait for the muse. But I think in that sense, uh, being an artist is a job, like your job or anyone else's job. You go to work. Some days you kind of want to be there. Some days you don't want to be there. But you start working, and as you start working, things begin to happen, and they suck you in, and all of a sudden you're working, and it, it just takes care of itself. So for a work day for you, uh, get up early, work all day, uh, get up early, do other things, work all afternoon and evening? How, well, I teach. Um, I've been teaching for 40 years at Alfred University, and Alfred has what is considered the world's most famous ceramic art program. I get up and I go there every morning, three days a week, Yes, and I teach all day. Then on the other days, I go to my studio very early, and I work all day, and then sometimes I'll get a phone call and I say, you know, it's time to eat, don't you think? <laughs> Is it important for an artist, any artist, to have that connection with people, be they students or just going out to lunch and living, a, maybe working as an insurance agent, having that connection as opposed to being the artist ensconced in his studio and brooding over something? Well, I think you need both. I mean, I think you need... For one thing, artists work, uh, it's pretty lonely. You have to work in your studio, you're by yourself. But I think the network of other artists, knowing other artists and communicating with other artists, is very important to continue to kind of keep things moving and keep you engaged. Uh, so it's a combination. And it's like 
you know, working, but also enjoying the idea that you might have an audience and yes. someone will come and look at the work. And someone who wants to look at your work as well. Now, we have an, uh, an exhibit this weekend, you're opening this weekend, correct? The Retrospective opens this weekend. It's a, an exhibition that shows the past 50 years of my work, probably 60 pieces in the exhibition, on Saturday um, the 27th. I think it opens around 2.30 at the ASU Art Museum. Okay, and this is the book, uh, this is a considerable volume here. This is a catalog, a life history, the whole nine yards. The whole nine it? yards. <laughs> Infinite place. Well, congratulations on a wonderful career, and good luck with the exhibit here uh, in Arizona, and I hope you enjoy your stay. Thank you for I'm joining us. I'm enjoying it. It's wonderful here. Very good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.